Attention crew, this is your Captain Caliban speaking. This is a supplemental episode of Enterprising Individuals, where we bring you news and tidbits from the world of Trek, also interviews with special guests, and a few little surprises along the way. Well, I'm still alive and unevolved after my talk last week with author Alan Gratz about the Voyager episode Threshold, voted by the fans at the 50th anniversary convention in Vegas, one of the worst Star Trek episodes of all time. It's not just me, I swear, but wow, was I not prepared for the outcry of support from certain fans for this little salamander that could, especially from some of the Star Trek Voyager fan groups that I frequent on Facebook. They say uh, things like, it's hardly the worst. You know, even within Voyager, it's not the worst. I, I hope you get lost in the Delta Quadrant. Okay, okay. You know, if you if you listen to the episode, Alan and I make the point that it really is an entertaining episode, even if it has somewhat troubling implications. And yes, yes, they are far worse episodes in the franchise, even in the beloved original series, actually, especially in the original series, which we say in the episode. At least at some point. I mean, it's it's pretty long. Next time, I'll include a too-long-didn't-read summary, a tilde. Hey, is there some kind of app on the internet that, like, reads posts and summarizes them quickly for you? It's called Tilder. It should be. Cut cut this part out. I'm going to make a fortune off of Tilder. Okay, you can start it back up here. <clears throat> anyway, um, I'm with you, people. I love both the good and the bad and the, shall we say, subjectively bad. And I'm against the hot take on Trek atmosphere embraced by some other Star Trek outlets. So, ally. Ally here. Threshold lovers and Caliban at Tanagra. But uh, it's still cool to bag on Enterprise, right? You have no idea how much I'm restraining myself from knocking you on your ass. Okay, Ziggy says there's a 94% chance you may also find today's episode distressing. First... We're going to hit some of the news from around the Trek sphere. And speaking of hot takes and the outlets that employ them, Star Trek II director Nicholas Meyer sat down with YouTube muckraker's Midnight's Edge recently, and he brought his spice rack with him. We'll look at some of his blistering comments about the current state of the Star Trek franchise. Sassy. Plus, it's the 50th anniversary of the Kiss Heard Around the Galaxy, which we'll discuss. And later in the show, we've got a special feature. The aforementioned Enterprise and Voyager take a lot of kicking, and as being not quite as good as earlier series, but what might happen if someone went, I don't know, Q post-atomic horror courtroom on everyone's favorite Trek series, Deep Space Nine? It might go a little something. Like the segment you'll hear later in the show when I reveal my worst of the best of DS9. So we've got a lot of ground to cover, and it might be a long time before we move along home, so let's get underway. Midnight's Edge. Edge is right there in the title. According to their own logline, they, quote, ask the questions no one else does, thereby providing you with a spin-free, bigger picture, end quote. Am I the only one old enough to remember the no-spin zone from Bill O'Reilly? Look how that turned out. It says a lot about an outlet that they have to remind you that they're, they're, they're not spinning things. No, really. I will say right now, on this show, on Enterprising Individuals, I deliver the Star Trek news that I find interesting with a little bit of my opinion provided as editorialization. Okay, sometimes it's a, it's a lot of my opinion, but, you know, you as a listener, you make up your own mind. That's our theme this week, with me not liking Threshold all that much, but maybe you do. Do it. Love it. Get a salamander tattoo. You know, Go for it. Whether or not I particularly like the episode that we discuss on any given episode of this show, I'm still going to talk about it with an erudite guest. We'll examine the always fascinating questions that Trek raises about the human condition, even if those humans are evolving into salamander people. That, that is my guarantee. What I'm not going to do is make videos with clickbait titles like is Star Trek Four dead? Or is Star Trek Discovery the least watched Trek of all time? Or do you love me yet, Daddy? Quick journalism tip. Uh, this is for both consumers and producers of news. When you've got a headline that presents a question which can be answered as yes or no, the answer to that question is almost always no. 99% of the time. It's, it's an inflammatory device. It's trying to get you to click that link. 
uh, that is in this day and age. But I mean, it's been around for a long time, like since the invention of the printing press. Like, uh, does Gutenberg not pay his employee enough? It's clickbait. Here, let me do a couple random headlines from the BBC. Uh, Should police be able to search mobiles? No, of course not. No. Uh, What happened when sextortion scammers targeted a BBC trending reporter? Nothing. Nothing did. It was an investigative journalism bit where an IT guy shows up. He shows her how to use two-factor authentication. This is from Vox.com. Is our constant use of digital technologies affecting our brain health? No. No, it doesn't. If you read the article, they talked to 11 experts and their consensus was, you know, that it was far from certain or even consistent in their answers. So uh, the answer to the implied question is no. Another from Vox. CBD. Look it up, Grandma. CBD is everywhere. But does it work? Uh, no, it doesn't. If you read the article, uh, maybe the placebo effect helps you. But the concentration that we're working at here with common CBD consumer products, no, it doesn't. So there you go. Uh, what was my point? Oh, yeah. Um, so when you see somebody on Facebook share an hour-long YouTube video that says, Trek is dead and Gene Roddenberry is crying in heaven, just know that it's yellow journalism and it's looking to get your clicks. And to be clear, yellow journalism works in either the security or the engineering department. Okay, rant about misleading gotcha journalism off. Now, let's look at the misleading gotcha interview with Nicholas Meyer. Uh, Meyer needs no introduction, at least I hope not, but suffice it to say that he wrote and directed Star Trek II, and he also helped write Star Trek IV, and he wrote and directed Star Trek VI. Um, He basically saved the TOS movie series uh, from failure and rebuilt it from the ground up after the uh, motion picture. And he's done some other stuff. He's he's a novelist and a producer uh, on season one of Discovery. Uh, And Khan is kind of his baby, um, movie Khan, of course. And because of that... As we've reported previously on this show, he was commissioned by CBS to write a con series uh, that would presumably be for CBS All Access. Well, in this hot interview, he gets pretty spicy about his treatment at the hands of CBS. According to Meyer, he was commissioned to write a three-hour event called SETI Alpha 5. And the script is complete, but he doesn't know the current status of the production. Ooh, he's getting hot getting sassy. Meyer cites the recent executive upheavals at CBS possibly being a factor and says, quote, I haven't heard from them in some time. Sassy. Yeah, I guess. And that seems fairly even handed as a response. I mean, it's weird that they would commission it and then just let it hang. Meyer's definitely a luminary in the history of Star Trek, at least for the Paramount films. And he's proved himself as somebody who creates fan favorite content, you know, a.k.a. the three best TOS films. So, okay. Uh, But nevertheless, uh, Meyer went off on CBS, speculating that the cost may be a factor, as the three-hour event would presumably be a three-episode miniseries, and CBS might not be willing to pay for it, since both seasons of Discovery experienced cost overruns. And then Meyer fired off, quote, I don't know the details of their thinking because I haven't heard them, end quote. That's sassy. Come on, Nick. Come on, you can be sassier than that. CBS, give Nick a call. I mean, he probably wrote this thing in a weekend. He's a fast worker. He wrote the script for Star Trek II in like 10 days, as we talked about uh, on our Space Seed episode. So, come come on. If this show's good, which I'm assuming it is, uh, he could probably blow out a whole 13-episode season in a week or two. Well, things heated up from there. As a lack of communication between CBS and Meyer became a running theme in the interview, Meyer said he hadn't heard from CBS about any future involvement with Discovery after his involvement with the show's first season. Then he dropped this truth bomb. Quote, I was involved with it for the first year, and I worked on it. I wrote things on it, and then I was not invited for the second year. I don't know why. Sassy, anyone? Come on, Nick. Spicier. Sassier. Yellow journalism. Come on. So many things have been going on behind the scenes at CBS. If you've been listening to our news reports on this show, that you know that you know Fuller has left the show. Then Harberts and Berg were removed for the showrunners. Uh, not to mention the resignation of CBS president Les Moonves, which we've talked about at length. And now there's umpteen million new shows in development. So why isn't Myers Con show going forward? That's not a yes or no question, by the way. I could have said, does the Con show not being picked up mean that Discovery is doomed? No, 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 it doesn't. Uh, If anything, they're spending so much money on Discovery that they don't want to pick up another show. And I think they are spending a lot of money on Discovery. Uh, You know, probably a little too much, but it's all on the screen. Uh, You can tell. 
And maybe right now they want to do that rather than make a show about a 50-year-old character uh, whose last uh, technical appearance in a film uh, was in a film that might actually be the worst Star Trek outing ever. Um, are we in agreement on that? That Into Darkness was bad? I think we all are, right? You can tweet me at, at EISDPod on Twitter if you somehow want to defend Into Darkness. Well, Nick Meyer isn't going to defend Into Darkness. In fact, he went into sassy warp drive when the conversation turned to Star Trek Into Darkness, the Kelvin Universe update to Star Trek II. Firing off a full spread, Meyer said, quote, It's that somebody wants to do an homage, and I was flattered. But in my sort of artistic worldview, if you're going to do an homage, you have to add something. If you have someone die and be resurrected immediately after, there's no real drama. It just becomes gimmicky. This is just one person's opinion. But I found it more clever than satisfying. Very sassy. Next up, will Megan Fox be in the new Star Trek movie as Lieutenant Commander Hot Sauce? And I, I, okay, I can't go on. There's, there's no meat on this bone. This bone is so bare, Carl Weathers is boiling some water and he's rubbing his hands together. Nick Meyer is a gentleman, and even if he wasn't, what's he going to do, get his show canceled? <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, try this. Tell him McG is remaking the 7% solution. We'll see what he's got to say. But come on, come on. Haters to the left. Cancel this hot take culture. Forget the scoops. Forget the yellow journalism. Love what you love, folks, and don't let anybody sour it for you. And when it comes to Trek journalism, in the words of Chancellor Flavor Flav, don't believe the hype. Yeah, boy! Well, it's been 50 years since the November 22nd, 1968 airing of the original series episode, Plato's Stepchildren. An episode that is it's probably on some people's worst of Trek lists, but it's not all that bad, is it? It's got telekinetic aliens, that's cool. Um, Barbara Babcock's in it. Uh, it's got togas. It's got a surprisingly anachronistic amount of respect by the crew uh, and the show itself for a little person, played, of course, by Michael Dunn, who, fun fact, was at one point considered for the role of Spock. And, of course, it's got... Bitter drinks. But what everyone remembers from the episode is its truly progressive moment, the kiss shared between Nichelle Nichols and William Shatner as Uhura and Kirk. A, <laughs> a tele... Kinetically coerced kiss, unfortunately. Telekinetically coerced kiss. That's my next t-shirt. But uh, progress. Progress, right? It's often cited as the first interracial kiss on television. But was it? No. See? See how that works? Was well, something something? Look, the answer is no. It works every time. Uh, actors of different races had been lip-locking for years before Star Trek did it. Uh, just mostly not on American TV. Uh, I've got a list of the interracial kisses that preceded Plato's stepchildren. Uh, this is all sourced from a Stack Exchange article. I'll include the link to it in the show notes. I found this fascinating. Uh, if you don't, I don't know, skip ahead a few minutes or something, but check this out. So the problem initially lies in what do we consider to be an interracial kiss? Because Lucy and Desi had been kissing each other since 1951. See? Boom. Gotcha. We're already done with the story. Uh, but it goes on a little farther than that. So if we're just going to assume that, oh, Kirk and Uhura kissing was the first uh, Caucasian um, African-American kiss. Well, even that's not true. But uh, let's go on. Uh, beyond the uh, Desi and Lucy kiss, uh, there was a kiss between a uh, African man and a Caucasian woman on a British TV show. Uh, it was a stage uh, adaptation, or, you know, they used to film stage plays for TV shows sometimes. Uh, it was called You and Your Small Corner, and it was broadcast in 1962. Uh, something else like that happened again on British TV on a British soap opera called Emergency Ward 10, uh, where a white guy kissed a black woman. Uh, the first ever, quote-unquote, interracial kiss that wasn't Lucy and Desi was on American TV on The Wild Wild West, where Jim West played by Robert Conrad, of course, kissed uh, Princess Ching Ling. It's fine, whatever. Uh, who's played by Pilar Surratt. Remember that name? She played Saibo in A Wolf in the Fold, which we just talked about. The first ever kiss between an African-American person and a Caucasian person on American TV was actually a year before Plato's Stepchildren came out. It was a musical special with Nancy Sinatra called Moving with Nancy. And she kisses Sammy Davis Jr., uh, either during or before or after a musical number. Look, I, <laughs> I like old TV, but I, I haven't seen old Nancy Sinatra specials. Now there is a podcast. And fun fact, William Shatner's kiss with Nichelle Nichols wasn't even his first interracial kiss 
on American television. He kissed the aforementioned Pilar Surratt in an episode of Naked City, which aired in 1962. Um, so progressive, yes. Um, not progressive part. Uh, he was playing a Burmese sailor, so not so great there. And it wasn't even Trek's first interracial kiss, as Shatner kissed Barbara Luna, who played Marlena Moreau in Mirror Mirror in 1967 in the second season. So there you go. Trek was a leader in many progressive topics without question. It's nice to see that they were nearly the first out of the gate on something like this. And kudos to them. And here's to another 50 years of positive representation among the stars. All right. So you love DS9, don't you? Don't you? Me too. The show is ambitious, not only in its commitment to serial storytelling and sci-fi TV, but also with that kissing stuff too. And uh, interracial marriage and gender fluidity and the civil rights movement and economic inequality and a holographic 60s casino for some reason. So whatever. Um, You think the show can do no wrong and it makes mid-period TNG look like late-period sliders. But I'm here to tell you that such high highs always come with some low lows. So here are my picks for five of the worst episodes of Deep Space Nine. And before we start, I want to say uh, season one gets a pass here. We all know that it was hard to get such a new concept for Trek off the ground, and they deserve some credit. So there's no move along homes or uh, if wishes were horses on this list. And feel free to at me later about how you wanted an ongoing plot line for Rumpelstiltskin or whatever. But here we go. Number five, Second Sight. Remember this one? There's a mysterious woman Cisco keeps running into, and she looks just like the wife of Scientist of the Week guy who's on the station. I know it's early in the show, but this episode just has everybody acting weird and out of character, and except for the interesting idea of mental projection of like another being, there's there's not that much that's original about it. I mean, having a dinner with an old scientist with a hot wife, but she's in love with one of the crew, it's got a real early TNG vibe, which is not something you want imported into this series. And the guy's studying a dying star, and then he crashes into it, and it reignites at the end? Oh, how fitting. Not great. Number four, Meridian. Before DS9 had the Dominion story arc to take them off of the station, they'd instead find themselves surveying the Gamma Quadrant or using the old, oh, we're returning from a conference and disaster strikes hook when they were trying to do standard here's a new planet Trek plots. Sometimes they're good episodes and sometimes not, but the Brigadoon planet, that one's just bad. If I had to limit myself to a single Dax episode... I guess it'd be this one, but on the whole, Dax episodes, especially the early ones, they're they're not my faves. I don't think they ever really knew what to do with the character, and I don't think Terry Farrell would disagree with me. Anyway, having Dax just randomly fall in love with a guy from the Brigadoon planet, and suddenly she's going to give up her commission in 800 years of her life, maybe that might make sense to a long-lived Trill, but that never really gets explored in the episode, and they probably should have left this planet unexplored too. Number three, Rules of Engagement, a.k.a. Ron Canada, attorney at Kapla. Rashomon always seems like a good idea when you're setting it up, but it rarely turns out all that well. And the device of having the characters address the camera directly in a Trek show, ugh, just just no. I would rather have seen them really explore the kind of crappy stuff that happens in war, like accidentally actually destroying a civilian ship instead of it being a cop-out secret plot. And the first Klingon lawyer? Just make that a series. CBS, call Ron Canada. Number two, Resurrection. I don't like the mirror universe. We get it. Everyone's evil there. I mean, people called Discovery's use of the mirror universe fan servicey, but DS9 just kept going back there. You can only get so much out of it, especially if you're just going to go there when you want a kind of funny episode. And every time you kill cast members, so it gets harder and harder to go back. And at this point, it's just unbelievable. Like, they have a Defiant too? Really? It's just, it's it's too much. Shattered Mirror should have been the last Mirror ep. Like, Mirror Jennifer's dead, and that was Cisco's tentative connection to the Mirror universe. We're done. But instead, we get we get Philip Anglum back, which is great, but it's an episode where we know that the shoe's going to drop on him being bad, and it takes so long to drop. And then the Intendant shows up, and her plan, it just really sucks. I mean, the Temple's never locked, and now they can just apparently jump between universes at will, so just go get the orb. Boom. Done. And number one... Profit and lace. No explanation needed. So there you go. It's a far from comprehensive list. People remember the good parts of DS9, but face it. I mean, they didn't get it right all the time. But when they did, they did it so well. What about you? 
Are you brave enough to admit that not every second of DS9 was pure televisional gold? What are your least favorite DS9 episodes? Let me know on Facebook or Twitter at EIST Pod or post them on our Facebook discussion group, Enterprising Interlocutions. Come on, be bad. No one will judge you. Be sassy. Did someone say Discovery? Oh, yeah, I did. Uh, if you haven't got your Discovery Season 1 Blu-ray yet, what are you waiting for? Whether as a holiday gift for a certain someone or just for your own collection, you can get the entire first season of Star Trek Discovery in beautiful HD on Blu-ray directly from Amazon by clicking on the link I've got in the notes for this show. And while you're in the Christmas spirit, allow me to make two more recommendations for cool Trek material. Try the book Live Long and Evolve, What Star Trek Can Teach Us About Evolution, Genetics, and Life on Other Worlds. It's a book by Mahal. Muhammad Noor about the astrobiology and the alien races found in Trek and how they relate to real world science. It is a biology of Trek, if you will. There's also Star Trek, The Art of John Eaves from Titan Books. It's a beautiful tome that collects many of the ship designs and art pieces from John's long career, starting from his work on Star Trek V until the present day. This will go great next to your technical manual or your Star Trek costumes book uh, by Paula Block, which if you don't have that, get it. It's great high-res pics of 50 years of costumes from the Star Trek universe. There are links for these items in the show notes. When you click on those links, you are taken directly to Amazon where you can shop away. And when you visit Amazon by clicking on our Amazon links or by clicking through the Amazon banner on enterprisingindividuals.com and you make a purchase, a percentage of that transaction comes back to us at no extra cost to you and helps keep the warp core lit here. And that deal counts for anything, not just Star Trek stuff. You can actually bookmark the banner, and when you click through to Amazon that way, whatever you buy, anything, same deal applies. Christmas is coming. The burnt, replicated bird is getting fat. So as you get the perfect gift, show us some Christmas cheer as well. And maybe you're saying, why would I take the word of a man who doesn't like profit and lace? Armin Shimmerman is a national treasure. To which I would say, you'll get no argument from me. But every man woman or man dressing as a woman has his her or their limits and that episode i reached mine but i would also say if you like what you hear on enterprising individuals and you want to support the show and increase the likelihood that we will eventually reach profit and lace on the show why not head to our patreon page at patreon.com forward slash eist pod it's there that you can sign up to be a crew member for the show for a small monthly donation and you can get access to our exclusive subscriber content like our live shows including our live show with melinda snodgrass at convergence 2018 my ds9 rewatch recaps i am not up to profit and lace just yet but you can help me get there also our new episode commentaries like our commentary for the cage their show merchandise and more just head to patreon.com forward slash eist pod become a member of the crew today anybody can join our crew no matter what they think of profit and lace just go to patreon.com forward slash eist pod we've also got t-shirts stickers posters laptop covers and more on our t public store and ho 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 the holidays are starting early as you can currently get 25 percent off on our store just head to tpublic.com and search for just enough trope that's our parent network when you check out use the promo code holiday cool all one word that gets you a 25 percent discount on whatever you buy uh, our janeway shirt our gauron shirt our suit up poster or merchandise enter holiday cool all one word at checkout for 25 percent on our t public store promotion ends on december 2nd so get cracking and as always anything you contribute to the show will be appreciated and will help keep us flying thanks remember listeners you can tweet to us or message the show and maybe have your comment read on the air just go to facebook.com forward slash eist pod or find us at at eist pod on twitter or through our social media links on enterprisingindividuals.com you can also reach the show at eist pod at gmail.com with feedback and suggestions or to just say hello we're waiting to receive your transmission and that's it for this supplemental episode of Enterprising Individuals. If you're an Apple Podcast listener and you haven't yet, why not look us up on Apple Podcasts and make sure that you're subscribed to the show. Also, write us a little review if the spirit moves you and give us a rating. At the very least, we'd appreciate it. If you're not an Apple Podcast listener, you can still subscribe to the show on Google Play or Stitcher or wherever you get our show from. And if you leave positive comments and ratings and reviews on those platforms as well, we'd be eternally grateful. Next week on Enterprising Individuals, 2018 is almost gone, and with it, another season of the show. We've had some great guests and some interesting discussions about some of your favorite and least favorite episodes of Trek, and we're gearing up for a big 2019. But next week, relax. 
light a fire, make yourself a big mug of hot cocoa, stir it up with a candy cane, put your feet up next to the tree, and listen for reindeer hooves on the housetop as we bring you a selection of some of the best moments from this year of Enterprising Individuals. Yes, Virginia, it really is a clip show. Next time on Enterprising Individuals. Until then, I'm your Captain Caliban signing off and saying live long and prosper. (laughs) 